I came here to give a talk on my project at the University of Minnesota at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Could you say just a little bit about your project, please? Yeah, I have been working on uh, this project almost for a year uh, under the great support from the U.S. government. I have been working with uh, North Korean refugees to help them to uh, uh, communicate better with South Korean citizens. So I developed a multicultural education program for elementary school students high school students and college students. And I operated uh, classes and I measured the effects. And now I'm presenting the um, project outcomes in many conferences and here at the U. Okay. Um, Professor Kim and I first met five years ago, at the time I was um, working for the Office of Equity and Diversity as a diversity fellow, along with Professor Kendall King of the College of Education. And we presented a series of programs focusing on different aspects of diversity. And the final program um, concerned Professor Kim's other area of expertise, which is international adoption, which is focused on, um, with a focus on Korean international adoption. And it was a fabulously successful program. We had more people than we could even fit in the room. And I was extremely impressed with her presentation on international adoption. And I was also at the time heading the university's interdisciplinary graduate group in disability studies, which I um, founded and head to this day. And I asked her, since she was going to be here on Fulbright through most of the summer, if she wouldn't grace our annual symposium with a talk about disability adoption, which is a very specific category in which things sometimes go differently um, than what you might call able-bodied adoption. Again, she gave a phenomenal paper. It was really, really well received, and we've been in touch ever since. Um, I was in Korea last summer, actually invited to study traditional Korean music, but Hyunan set it up so that I could give a couple of talks at uh, her alma mater, Korea University, on issues that are useful concern to us, um, issues that relate to both disability and to adoption and to refugee status and to multiculturalism around the idea of identity and the idea that identity is not fixed, the idea that identity um, is highly dependent on context, and we're actually working on an article that's in its sort of final stages of revision um, prior to publication, and one of the other things we'll be doing while we're lucky enough to have Professor Kim here in Minnesota is to put the finishing touches on this article. So that's what we're doing. Uh, could you say a little bit about your own career and the roots of your own interests? Please? Oh, sure. Well, I came here in 1979. Most people would say it was a long time ago. Uh, my field of training is actually music composition. I came here to teach composition and music theory and other courses. And I wouldn't say that my career took a turn. It just took an addition. Um, starting in the year 2000, I began to have certain sort of um, physical issues and some very major surgeries and experiences with rehabilitation and return to work issues. Um, both as they relate to my work as a musician and then also beyond that it became a very big interest of mine and I began to do work in the field of dis interdisciplinary disability studies and from there a great deal of my own work focuses on musicians with disabilities but also sometimes not musicians and also people with disabilities in higher education um, I sometimes write about religion as well but I've made many colleagues in very many fields but my, my approach, um, I'm very interested in the idea that people are disabled or able-bodied, dependent upon what I call the social confluence, and um, which is to say the context of the moment that a person is in. And we, I shared that research with Professor Kim, and we agreed that it had, as I'd hoped, many other applications. And one of them is the work that she's doing right now with refugees. 
So it, it's not just that um, she's my esteemed colleague, but one with whom we found sort of a common basis in theories of identity. And Professor Kim, could you say just a bit about the the roots of your your specific interests and your own your own intellectual uh, path? My research interests. Yes. In me. Yeah. I, I mean, yes. I just how you came to be involved with these questions. Okay. Uh -huh. I have been very interested in minority groups, especially in Korea, such as adoptive families and. North Korean refugees and multicultural background uh, families. Uh, I would, would uh, like to talk a little bit more about my personal family background. I uh, Sometimes I introduce myself as half North Korean and half South Korean because my father's ancestors, they moved from North Korea 70 years ago. And my mom, she is from Seoul, South Korea. So I have a kind of feeling that I have some social obligation to understand them more, or if I can, I want to help them to adapt uh, in South Korean society better. So I have been uh, supporting North Korean refugees uh, more than 10 years as just volunteers, not just for research. and. Uh, Working with them, I had a, an idea. I need to make a kind of multicultural education program for it, uh, a mutual better understanding. So I um, have been developing my ideas. And US Embassy in Seoul, they uh, got to know my idea, and they really liked my idea. And they asked me, uh, can we help you? Can we help you to develop your idea more? So I uh, was uh, very thankful to uh, focus more on my project. So uh, about a year ago, I uh, could start my project. And now I finished operating all classes in many elementary schools, high schools, and colleges. And I got very good effect, col uh, class effects in terms of children, adolescents, and college students' evaluation. So I think the multicultural education is very important for, uh, not only for North Korean refugee settlement, but also better understanding over uh, multicultural acceptance of South Korean citizens. Could you sketch for us some of the problems of North Korean immigrants in the South? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, uh, first of all, many North Korean refugees uh, told me about their um, issues. Uh, one of the big issues uh, is language. We are one nation and we have same language, but they have a little bit different accent. So when they uh, move down to South Korea and when they just talk hello, we immediately can recognize, oh, they are from North Korea. So some people, not all, but some people uh, look down on them and they could feel the feeling so it hurts them a lot. So language is a big deal, and uh, they are uh, have been lived in uh, North Korea, where the communism or the dictatorship is very strong. So they are used to kind of communi communism. So hard to adapt in uh, South Korea. The, uh, more we have capitalism or westernized uh, thinking, so they need to adapt uh, in a totally new world for them. They thought, oh, we would be okay because it's like our uh, hometown, but it's not true. So they have very, very hard time to adapt and uh, settle down in South Korea. And other, they have uh, many issues, but uh, many of their children 
they have a hard time to adapt in schools because our school system is, uh, is different from North Korean uh, school system. And we learn English, but they, don't, they didn't learn English and so on. So they have many problems uh, and they need some help from South Korean citizens. But many uh, South Korean citizens, they are not happy with helping them because some of them think we uh, are losing our tax. Yeah. So we need uh, to understand them more and maybe the uh, better communication uh, would be helpful for uh, each of us. Could you say just a little more about uh, the attitude of South Korean citizens towards North Koreans coming down? Mm. Um, we have kind of mixed feeling. In some part, we have kind of um, empathy, sympathy. So we want to understand them of how hard life they have been uh, having t until now. But in uh, on the other hand, some people are afraid of um, losing their job opportunities or uh, our government support them, um, uh, giving them house for free yeah. and giving them uh, early settlement money. So some South Korean people are not happy with them, with uh, this political uh, in institution. It's my understanding that it would be very dangerous for someone in North Korea to attempt to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, what sorts of people take that risk? Would you... What kind of people, what, what kinds of stories do you encounter from the people who are coming uh -huh, south? Uh -huh. The what, reason why? Yeah, the reason why, and, and, and I mean, it must be a rather pressing reason given that this is a, this is a very risky thing to do. Yes, of course. Yeah, they had to pass uh, normally more than three or four different countries before they moved down to Korea. First, they passed China, later Vietnam, Cambodia. So it took long, long uh, time. But uh, they, the main reason for them to move to South Korea is just it's simple uh, to have better life. And there many people are uh, starving. So to eat better, yeah. to live better, so that's uh, the main reason, I think. And what goals or principles guided your, your multicultural curriculum? What were you trying to do with that curriculum as you developed it? Mm -hmm. Actually, we have almost 30,000 North Korean refugees in South Korea. But before I uh, started to support them as a volunteer, volunteer, I never uh, met one North Korean refugee in South Korea. We have many, but maybe they uh, are hiding themselves, uh, have, have no courage to uh, come out. So one, uh, one day I thought, I'm teaching at, co at the college, so one day I thought, oh, oh, what about if I invite them to my class and let my students uh, can meet them and talk with them. Uh, so I invited some of the North Korean refugees uh, through the National uh, Support Center for North Korean Refugees. And we had very wonderful time. My, all of my students and the refugees, they told me uh, it was just a um, terrific time for us and we will never ever forget the good time. And we learn a lot from uh, talking with others who 
have been living in totally different situation. It uh, we think it helped us to be matured, to understand others more. So I uh, wanted to develop this program more and better. So that's how. And and what is what is the program like? Can mm -hmm. you describe how it works okay. or or what the what the pieces are? Okay. Uh, uh, the first step, I wanted to make a program based on uh, students' needs, not based on my needs. So I asked a student, "What would you like to do, or what? What? How? How long uh, do you want to?" Uh, uh, communicate if you have North Korean refugees in your class or what kind of method or what uh, uh, subject, subtitles do you want to talk with them. So I measure their needs uh, and based on their needs I developed uh, the class curriculum uh, for two hours. The two hours, the Korean students, well, actually they wanted, we wanted, most of them wanted two hour long uh, class activities. So I um, have been working with uh, my project team. Uh, some of them are elementary school teachers, and high school teachers, and college professors. So uh, who also, they had good experiences working with North Korean refugees. So uh, for me, I, I think I was very lucky to work with them because they are very experienced already. So based on uh, students' needs, we developed the contents or the methods of the class activities. So we trained North Korean refugees as a lecturer who can lead the class for two hours. And we train them how to uh, give uh, uh, students some lectures and how can um, um, uh, invite students to their topics or to their conversation. And for elementary school students, uh, for example, we uh, include some fun activities such as uh, quiz games quiz games and role playing and uh, small group discussions and presentations they love to do that and I um, took some rewards for them little things but some chocolate bars mm. And uh, they love to 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 participate in yes. And when I ask them, uh, did you like this class or what uh, uh, do you did you like most? They uh, most of the students they said we love uh, role playing. I uh, will remember what I uh, played as an actor. Uh, some students act, uh, act like uh, North Korean refugees, so they should be uh, uh, pretending as a uh, uh, refugee from mm -hmm. North Korean borderline to China, so they could understand more, more their uh, hardship. And, and for high school, we made a little bit different class activities. They uh, want to have more discussions, so we made uh, uh, activities, uh, let them um, participate in small group dis discussions. <coughs> College also, yeah. Uh, so we have a little bit different, three different type of class activities. So this time I will. Uh, present focusing on elementary school students and uh, how they uh, report uh, on the class activity effects. And how widely is this curriculum used? Our, our school, our, does this curriculum uh, get used in many schools? 
um, it's not the regular curriculum, so it's kind of extra curriculum. So if some school asks us to do that, we can do it. Uh, but it's not a, a kind of the it's one of the experimental process. So hopefully the U.S. governments they um, wants to support me more. Then we can spread out the program. Hopefully, national widely. So, what do you do? Do you hope for as a result mm -hmm. of introducing this curriculum widely? Mm -hmm. To promote so, uh, uh, civil society and conflict resolution. And and now in Korea, South Korea, the multicultural issues are a very hot issue, but we didn't uh, prepare or we didn't do uh, uh, much about that. So I think my uh, endeavor, my uh, trial is, might be very little one, but it could be helpful for us to live in a multicultural society or a global society um, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious given given your uh, your your uh, account of your own interests and the, the, the journey you've undertaken where do you see the point of connection or intersection with Pro professor Kim's work well, we've had some very good exchanges about um, <coughs> understanding how um, people might be perceived very differently. Korean identity um, and Asian identity in general, I, I would point out that my wife is Japanese American and is an artist who performs traditional Japanese music, so I have a um, strong connection with Asian American communities and particularly in Minnesota with the Korean adoptee community. Many of the artists that she and to a lesser extent I have worked with are Korean adoptees, and in fact, there's something quite natural, it seems, with the kind of difficult identity questions that a transracial adopted person has to negotiate, having perhaps been raised by parents whose background is completely different, who doesn't look like them, um, having expectations if one is, say, an Asian adoptee who grew up in a white, very um, family with a very strong European cultural base and yet is perceived very differently. Um, and just questions of how a person might be perceived. For instance, um, one of the first things that I did when I was in Korea with uh, Professor Kim last summer was to attend church with her. And it's a very progressive church and they were they have a multicultural service every week and um, are also doing work with North Korean refugees and one of the things that one notices is that the people who are regarded as contributing to the multicultural in Korea would very easily be lumped together as one ethnic group here because they were Chinese nationals, Filipino nationals, both of whom are typically what we would think of as guest workers. Maybe not so much here but it's in Europe. And then also uh, North Koreans. and. Um, in the United States, that, that entire group of people might be perceived from beyond their own spheres as being Asian American or perhaps even simply Asian. So the, and that has implications for how one negotiates one's circumstances. So I, I think we were both pretty intrigued at the possibilities for what I've done with people who have shifting um, identities as regards disabled or not and how some of the theoretical thinking could transfer over to questions of identity. Um, one very specific thing that's less theoretical and one of the things that you haven't quite raised is that many North Korean refugees, from what I understand, because of things um, like brutal treatment, uh, malnutrition, um, come to South Korea experiencing, first of all, they tend to be smaller. Um, they tend to be frail. They tend to have various kinds of mental 
disabilities, developmental delays. I, I don't know what all of them are, but to be North Korean in South Korea, in many ways, I think, is to be a person with a disability. So this is one of the things that also intrigued us. Um, years back, um, the question of disability identity, um, I, I've heard said that the only country in the world where people routinely adopt disabled kids is the United States. And you know, the United, there are a lot of things you can criticize this country for, but if in fact that's true, or if it's true in a greater degree here than it is in other countries, we can maybe pat ourselves on the back a little for the fact that we do that. Uh, but if, if I'm getting your facts straight from an earlier study that she did and also presented here, you have to understand Professor Kim has a fan club in Minnesota. She's been here many, many times and has lots of admirers. You, people find out she's in town, big party. But um, that while domestic adoption has increased to some degree in um, South Korea, where it used to be something of a taboo, the one category in which that really hasn't happened in significant numbers is disability adoption, where disabled kids are still largely being adopted internationally and particularly in the United States. So we have, you have theoretical interests, and then we have this intersection around disability. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I'm, I'm curious about your thinking at this point on this matter of disability and identity. Mm -hmm. How are you thinking about that? And what, what, what is the cutting edge of your own work there? The cutting edge of my own work um, it's pretty far removed from the, if you were to ask me what I've been writing a couple days ago even, I've got, we are finishing an article together and we're going to do that while she's here and it, we've pretty well described what that work is, applications of what we call social confluence theory to identity questions and we contrast questions that concern disability in general and disabil disabled musicians in particular with what Korean identity means in Korea and abroad, and whether there are categories. And I, I just want to point out, in Minnesota, you often hear people of Korean ancestry being referred to as either adoptees or non-adoptees. And what that tells you is that in Minnesota, to be Korean, mm -hmm. being adopted is actually the norm, because we have the largest concentration of Korean adoptees anywhere. Um, but moving on, right now, I'm, I'm doing some work on um, disabled musicians again, and the difference between what I call disabled gestures and gestures disabled. I'm contributing to a colleague's book on gesture theory. He's a mathematician, so it's pretty far removed from what we're talking about here, but comparing two pretty famous jazz pianists, one of whom was a congenital, um, congenitally disabled. He was a polio survivor and always played the piano with a disability, and it has this he has very unique textures and gestures in his music as a result of having a severely impaired right hand. And then another pianist, actually the man's name is Horace Parlin, the other pianist is much more famous, is Oscar Peterson, who's one of the most famous jazz pianists ever, and who late in his career um, had a major stroke that left him with um, very limited use of his left hand. And uh, he plays with what I call gestures disabled, which is to say he plays basically the same way as he played prior to injuring his hand, except minus one hand. So um, I'm focusing in really closely on music and the difference between congenital disability and acquired disability and how that impacts music making. Um, another project that's on the books now concerns, um, I, I gave a paper at the Law and Society Association when I was here last year, and also gave it at Korea University, the idea of disability and citizenship. And I'm taking the concept of citizenship and writing it rather large, which is to say, <coughs> not just you know legal bodies determining who is the citizenship, but musical practices and who determines who gets to participate and who does not. And in some cases, as, for instance, music schools, professional orchestras, the rules of who can do what and who's allowed to participate in on what basis are pretty well spelled out because they are institutions and they are therefore institutionalized in other fields. For instance, the ones I talk about in an article that just came out, jazz or electronic dance music, 
there are unwritten rules, but they are rules nevertheless. And they have impacts on people with disabilities versus able-bodied people in terms of the levels of participation. So it's another um, area that interests me. And I've done another piece that's just waiting to be finished about the blues, which is music. I, not in an ethnic way, but I grew up with it because I grew up in Chicago and it's that was the capital of the blues world and it's music that matters to me. And I've been writing about um, some of the differences between being a blind blues singer and being a sighted blues singer. And uh, one of the really curious ones is that although blind musicians, there's a special reverence for them, there are almost no blues songs about blindness. It's, so one of the rules seems to be that although we might revere you because we think you have this sort of special insight that comes from your impairment, don't sing to us about it. And what you learn from that, I think, is that when people hear the blues, what they're listening for is their own catharsis, their own relief, their own release, and not the release of the person who's actually providing the music. So it's a very sort of interesting approach to empathy, where uh, at the one time you have these revered artists, and you revere them because of their impairment, but you don't want to hear about the impairment. So I, I was actually quite fascinated with that. So I do a lot of things about music and disability, and it sounds like they're kind of all over the place. Um, being a Minnesotan, another person that um, I work on sometimes is Bob Dylan. And uh, there was at one time a very <coughs> widely spread rumor, less so now, that Bob Dylan is autistic. And um, I've done some work on, not on whether I think he is or he isn't, because I don't think anyone who speculates on this would, would have any way of knowing because he's a very private person. But what does it mean that so many people think this about this musical icon? Um, what, what do they want from the, the idea that this musical icon has this mental disability? So I'm really intrigued with that. People get something from the idea that someone else is disabled. They, there's some kind of value for them in that. And that's what I've been speculating on. Well, I think about the categories of otherness. I mean, autism's pretty, pretty generally regarded as a disability. Yes, right. Bipolar disorder, not so clear, <laughs> seems to me. Well, among people on the autistic spectrum themselves, they often describe themselves as non-neurotypical and they'd say, no, this is not an impairment, we are just different. And we have, um, in some cases, a proclivity towards skills that other people do not have. The University of Toronto, there's an Autistic Student Cultural Center, separate from, here we have a Disabled Student Cultural Center. And um, there are a number of people who write about the idea that autism is a cultural difference. I mean, it may be a cultural difference based on choices that people were not able to make, but it, they view it as being an aspect of diversity rather than an aspect of disability. But you're right about bipolar disorder, too. I've read, um, or I maybe don't even want to use the word disorder, but I've read Kate Jamison, for instance, about that, and how she has felt that it, it's contributed to her um, work as an author. So with bipolar disorder, people have been able to, some or bipolar difference, mm -hmm. people have been able to represent this and pretty successfully represent it in popular culture and so forth as a kind of gift with some downsides I think and a, a way of being in the world like being seven feet tall. <laughs> I think rather like being seven feet tall. Or being five foot three like me. Yeah, I mean, if you're seven, well, we're five foot three. Well, I think, let me stay with seven for a minute. Okay, sure. With seven, you're going to bump your head a bunch of times. Yeah. And furthermore, there are going to be lots of things that are just not built for you. But there are all sorts of contexts in which you really want somebody seven feet tall uh, for various purposes. And it turns into sort of a wash, or maybe even a slight advantage. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. and, uh, and I mean, I, I, I don't want to, I'm just thinking 
they got a status established. Bipolar seems to have gotten something like a status established of difference without criticism. <laughs> I, I think to some extent that's true. I think you, you'll also meet people who live with that condition who say that it's an absolutely a liability and that it's made their lives unhappy. And I, I know people like Sure. That. So it, it cuts both ways. One of the foundational theories of disability studies is uh, the idea of social construct and the idea that um, they make a distinction between disability and impairment. And impairment is the bodily difference and disability is the socially imposed difference. And very hardcore social modelists, and they are sort of centered in the UK, would say that uh, society, if it wished to be, could completely address all of the difficulties of people with impairments such that they would cease to be disadvantaged at all. Now that's one um, of the theories that underlines much of disability studies, and it's one that's been criticized almost since its beginning, but it's one that some people hold to very fiercely. Um, people would counter that and have by saying things like chronic fatigue or chronic pain, um, even if attitudes, societal attitudes towards those things were far, far better, one would still be fatigued or one would still be in a great deal of pain. Um, when I was uh, one of the dis diversity fellows for the Office of Equity and Diversity, uh, I was I was actually lucky enough to um, pick the um, keynote speaker for the Diversity Across the Disciplines Conference, and he was a well-known disability theorist named Tobin Siebers, who's died recently, and is a good friend of mine, and was a polio sufferer. And I think um, he was a person who proposed an alternative to social constructivity, which he called realism. The idea that, yes, some of these things are life experiences that transcend um, societal attitudes. And I think that his appearance at, as a keynote speaker here really bore that out because he had limited energies owing to post-polio syndrome and wasn't able to attend most of the conference himself. And that was not a question of social construction, it was a question of limitations on what he was able to do. And I always, you know, I think about that and I thought that was really very, very sad that this um, brilliant scholar who came and gave a fantastic talk about pain and had enough of it that he wasn't able to attend the entire conference where he was honored with the keynote. But as I think about it, if the conference had extended over two weeks, mm -hmm. he could have attended every session. Well, yeah, and people have said that. Um, every year, people say, in the Society for Disabilities, they say, well, you know, we've got, the sessions are way too long. Um, actually being gone for the long haul may also present its own problems, but I do see exactly what you're saying. That if we had shorter sessions, if we had longer rest periods, and on the other hand, I mean, speeches, political speeches used to be four hours long. Still are in some and, and, and concerts were running about nine. And, I mean, if, if, if you did, if you tail tailored your conferences to the attention span of Richard Feynman, let's say, mm -hmm. you would run from eight in the morning to midnight, and we'd all be under the table by the end. And there are people who would certainly advance that as an argument. I mean, there are other things that would be very difficult to dispute, like chronic pain, for instance, which even if you can go to the entire conference, yeah. um, still hurts. Yeah, it's one of the or the fact that um, being the head of the interdisciplinary graduate group, I will tell you that some of the people in our group um, aren't able to do as much as they would like to do because it's just harder, uh -huh. um, or it requires a lot of logistical support that's not always available. Um, and the other thing is that some people don't live as long as other people. I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap yourself around the idea that the difference between a person who doesn't live as long as someone else owing to some kind of impairment 
that that's simply a social construct. That's unfortunate, I think, under any circumstances. We, we want to live longer, in general, right. as long as life is good. Well, but it, it'll be a different thing, won't it, to say on the one hand, uh, it's very unfortunate that people have certain con conditions. Yes. And on the other to say, they must have, they will necessarily have more limited uh, opportunity to participate in the activities they care about than other people because of that. I mean, it's a, you know, there are usually ways, yes. even with short, with short lives, yes, absolutely. there are usually ways to scaffold people's uh, situations sure. such that they can accomplish uh, what they what they need to accomplish, and, and the perfect should not be the enemy of the good. I mean, we have it already since 1990, legally inscribed that it is our responsibility to create equity for people with disabilities to the degree responsible in this country, and it served as a model for the UN right. uh, Charter on people with disabilities. Thank you. So yes, it, this is our responsibility. We may not always be able to create equality. We can always strive to the greatest extent possible for equity. Professor Kim, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, we've, we've kind of gone off into the disability world, but I'm wondering if you have thoughts about these, these issues of disability and identity and the integration of people with disabilities into the larger society in your own context in Korea. Oh, I'm afraid of talking about it because he is the perfect expert <laughs> in this field. <laughs> but um, my opinion, I know, only know a little bit about Korea, Korean situation. In our society, I think the disability, people who have disabilities, they have, how do you say, the, Stigma? Yes. Uh -huh. It's a, a classic in disability yeah. center, which is a book uh -huh. that is by mm -hmm. Irving Goffman called, mm -hmm. and the title of the book is Stigma. Yeah. Yes. I think it's a little bit um, universal, yes. but uh, uh, worse in Korea, I think, because here you uh, value or you think about diverse, diversity mm -hmm. or you think more <laughs> about their potential. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Still, in Korea, for us, it's a big stigma, incapability, or the lack of some uh, competence. Mm -hmm. So many people are suffering from that kind of uh, evaluation. So ident uh, Korean identities, I think, that in terms of disability, it um, has many negative aspects. You, you told me on occasion that the yeah. um, disabled adoptees who we yeah. know here, just, mm -hmm. that was a good thing, that they were mm -hmm. able to have better mm -hmm. lives. Social mm -hmm. construction is aside, mm -hmm. the situation in Korea is such that yeah. they mm -hmm. have benefited mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the international mm -hmm. adoption. Mm -hmm. And we, we have friends who mm -hmm. fall into that mm -hmm. category here. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say just a bit about how that, the stigma expresses itself in Korea? or how it manifests itself? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the past, even we don't have the terminology mm. of uh, disability. Uh, I, it's very hard for me to translate in English, but when I was little, uh, the, the people who uh, is disabled we call them kind of very, very bad words to them, uh, like sick body or illness. That means people with disabilities. But now we change or we have new terminology. So we call them people who is handicapped uh, or need uh, some more help. So more positive uh, mm -hmm. yeah, changes we have, but still the changes, I think, slow, slow than uh, uh, I hope. Uh, and still many people uh, has uh, big stigmas. 
So based on your work in multicultural education, mm -hmm. do you see any way of proceeding with respect to the stigma against disability in Korea? Can, is a comparable educational enterprise possible? Mm -hmm. I think it's possible based on the children's uh, evaluation of the class <laughs> effects. They think uh, before they took the class, after uh, they uh, all the class done, they uh, said, we now respect them more we can understand them more. It means a lot and I think it's very significant to uh, let them understand other people who normally had uh, stigmas in uh, this society. So would it be possible to bring people with disabilities mm -hmm into classrooms, mm -hmm. doing the same kinds mm -hmm. of activities mm -hmm. that you uh, use with people from, from North Korea. Yeah. I think that is the same concept the still is available for uh, helping us to have better understanding. So maybe not the North Korean refugees, but the disabled disabled people can lead the class and have the similar class activities and maybe the focus, main focus would be um, the life of dis disabled people or the better communication with each other would be uh, 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 another good option. So thanks for your good point. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, of course, in the United States, and especially in Minnesota now, we have our own problems mm -hmm. with coming to terms with immigrants mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with w w a variety of immigrants mm -hmm. and coming to terms with disabilities also. Uh, and, uh, and coming to terms with old historical divisions within our society. Mm -hmm. um, do you see ways in which the Korean experience, the, the work that you've done, might carry over mm -hmm. to our own problems of multicultural education? Mm -hmm. I think it's applicable. Up, up, yeah, uh -huh. we have a different dynamics, but we can um, uh, find some good point to uh, apply to another society. So um, you, I know you have many refugees, including Mom. Mm -hmm. uh, still Mom. Yeah, still in the big. Uh, population here, yeah. so yeah, uh, or some native Indian yep. issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you, you can bring the uh, topics to uh, children's class and uh, make a um, multicultural education program. Then I think it would work well. Well, it is very hopeful to hear that bringing someone in for two hours, mm -hmm. speaking from their own experience, mm -hmm. and then engaging in various mm -hmm. kind of age-appropriate activities, mm -hmm. makes significant change. Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, I would not have expected mm -hmm. that one could make such change mm -hmm that quickly. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and if that experience carries over to Minnesota classrooms, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's, it's really a very small investment mm -hmm. and could be, could be done quite yes. broadly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
even me, I didn't expect such such big impact in uh, not only the elementary school student, children, high school students, <coughs> and college students all have the same, almost same big effects. So just only two hour long class, and if we get such a, a good effect, why not? Why not? <laughs> We need to apply, or I think, as you told us, it's very economic solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think perhaps that the reason this is so particularly effective is that there's already <coughs> among South Koreans mm -hmm. some inclination mm -hmm. to? identify with or to um, have sympathy for the people in the north. Yeah. I mean they they're not others. Right. They haven't been they 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 haven't been others yeah. very long. Uh -huh. The diff the sense of difference is over can be overcome mm -hmm. in 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 a fairly easy an a relatively mm -hmm. easy way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um in, in a way, the question is sort of how particular is that problem mm -hmm. to your situation mm -hmm. and how much we want to hope mm -hmm. that these same ideas mm -hmm. and strategies mm -hmm. can be generalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The question is, mm -hmm. it may be that the situation in North Korea is quite particular. Yes. Because Very the separate unique. there is a, yeah. there's an oh, an, uh, an underlying unity mm -hmm. assumed, mm -hmm. which might not be assumed, for mm -hmm. example, by students who have Somali mm -hmm. students in their classroom mm -hmm. or who encounter Somali mm -hmm. Muslims mm -hmm. on the street. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah. uh, in, you might be having a little bit different effects, mm -hmm. but I would like to introduce some of my experiences. Actually, uh, I developed the curriculum almost, I would say almost, I would try, I tried to um, make a program almost 100% based on their needs, but one thing I couldn't um, uh, I couldn't apply, I couldn't um, mirror is all the students wanted women, women refugees. I don't know why, but maybe they get the men from North Korea to how do you say to they think it's very aggressive. Mm. So they almost all students just want mm -hmm. the woman lecturer. So I wanted to train uh, uh, refugees from <coughs> women, but uh, elementary school and high school I could meet uh, have uh, uh, female lecturers, but uh, college class uh, none of them were available. So I worked with a male. North Korean refugees. Mm -hmm. So it might be a kind of uh, unexpected experiences mm -hmm. for many South Korean students, but after the class they felt, oh, it's good. Uh, we wanted woman, but men <coughs> is also good. So a little bit different <coughs> dynamics or expectation or different situation you might have. Uh, but I think um, at least uh, we uh, can try and have, maybe we can uh, see the different outcomes and, and we can compare the why or how or even the next step, we can think about it more. So you started working with North Korean refugees as a volunteer, yes. uh -huh. and that your your research has, and your curriculum writing has come out of that yes. experience. Mm -hmm. 
in your ongoing relationships mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. North Korean refugees, mm -hmm. do you see things improving for them? Do you, do you see greater acceptance? Mm -hmm. Are they becoming more comfortable? What's it like for them? Mm -hmm. how, are, how is the society evolving? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the class effects from South Korean students was huge, I think, I would say. But uh, it's, uh, I, frankly speaking, it's my dilemma. I couldn't find big changes from North Korean refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, they said they had more confident confidence. They could have more confidence, but um, I wanted to help them their self advocacy. Uh, but uh, and only few refugees uh, took part in my project compared to many South Korean students. So normally one mm -hmm. lecturer and two more volunteers from North Korea refugees. I um, um, took them to each class. So only few North Korean refugees could take part in. Um, uh, so uh, the next step, I want to make uh, extended program uh, which can include more North Korean refugees and let them uh, help, uh, let them develop uh, uh, citizenship better. Do you see any possibility for bringing South Korean comparable South Korean speakers to talk to North Korean groups about their experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it, can it be turned around? Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, to have a big class because they are very, very busy and their situation is hard to uh, for me, when I was working with them, to uh, have a meeting with at least one or two refugees was so, so hard. So in uh, realistic reason, I think it's very hard, the, the, the opposite situation. But it's a very, very good idea. But you just can't get a group together yes, yes. to do the yes. kind of comparable mm -hmm. uh, multicultural mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's a very good idea because my program is very helpful for um, South Korean students to understand North Korea or North Korean refugees better. So the opposite direction is also we need to work more. So that might be an, uh, um, another good project. Well, that leads into uh, an important matter, and that is, where do you see your work going next? Mm -hmm. What projects do you want to take on, mm -hmm. in say, in the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, next step, I'm thinking about um, the way or how I can help North Korean refugees uh, to be uh, included in South Korean society more easily. So I'm thinking uh, the activities, now this time, activities outside the classroom. Uh, maybe I can develop uh, the program such as volunteership program with South Korean students, but outside the classroom, they can uh, do something together and they can uh, participate more actively. So, and mm. uh, so 
that would be my uh, second year uh, project theme, and I want to develop it more. Is there any context now mm -hmm. in which North and South Korean people sit down and tell stories and talk with each other and exchange information outside of a classroom? Mm -hmm. Does it happen in church? Does it happen in social clubs? Is there any place which is, a, an, is anything like an equal meeting ground? I have I've never ever heard or never seen. Yeah, actually, the the topics outside the Korea more people are interested in. In South Korea, actually, people they don't think about it further or hmm. so. Whenever I travel um, Europe or America, many people uh, they were asking me about these issues. But actually, inside the Korean people, um, for them, it's um, forgot already forgotten issues. But when they uh, uh, were asked about the issues, they are interested in. But I think they have no opportunity to get involved. Yeah. Is this somebody you'd like to speak to at all? You know, I'm reminded, um, just <laughs> one of the places where I've done some work, because there's actually a lot of interest in disability issues, is in the tiny country of Malta, south of Italy, in the Mediterranean, which lately has been on the news a lot because it's the southernmost <laughs> country in Europe, and it's one of the first places where refugees from North Africa I mean, they leave from North Africa. They may actually be from places like Syria, but they also come from the Horn of Africa. They come from Libya. People who just want to get out of wherever they are. And the first place they set foot is in this tiny and very densely populated country in the middle of the Mediterranean. And what you're telling me about South Koreans is what I have heard from my Maltese friends. Um, Malta is, or historically, was one of the most homogeneous countries mm -hmm. in the world. I mean, it was mostly, you know, overwhelmingly Maltese. The, really, the only exceptions were that uh, because of its heritage as a British colony, there were a certain number of Brits who would retire there. It's a lovely place. But they, and it's also the most Roman Catholic country in the world, or it was. Um, and people tended to think of their country, and I think this is true in South Korea, as being ethnically very homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And... I at least had been told that the Maltese really didn't want to think about this. Mm -hmm. um, I think they have to now, there's really no way around it, but they liked things the way that they were. And I don't think it so much had to do with any particular animus against any particular group, as that they had a very strong identity of themselves as being Maltese and um, very homogeneous. Even though almost everyone speaks English, they adore their language, which is spoken <laughs> nowhere else in the world. And um, it's a very big ask to say to people, okay, you've been this ethnically and religiously homogeneous now for as long as you can possibly remember. Now we're going to change that around completely. We're going to have a whole lot of people here who are not in many ways like you at all. Um, and I think that societies that view themselves as homo, Japan would be another category, but very few of them, I think, are as ethnically homogeneous. And in a lot of cases, I would say, um, people find ways, because people have a need for difference, and they have a need for an other to project certain feelings upon, find um, ways to perceive people as being other. I mean so that um, North Koreans are viewed in a way as being a different ethnic group, as being something distinctive. Um, people who would be viewed from the outside as being homogeneous, people find ways of creating differences out of what they have. Mm -hmm. I still remember the little towns of my youth which had 
Polish Catholic churches on mm -hmm. one corner and Irish Catholic churches on the other and uh -huh. Norwegian Lutherans and Swedish Lutherans and, and then sometimes divisions within the Norwegian Lutherans. You know. I mean, uh, the, the need for an other and also the terrible stake in being alike. Yes. Now, since you've worked with disability, is do we have a is there a comparable stake in disbelieving in disability in thinking that we're all equally able? We could all go out and play a volleyball game together if we wanted to. Well, that would be a challenge, but there would be I would say that the, the theory of social construction, which is that all of the difficulties that are encountered by people who are thought of as being disabled are socially constructed. I mean, that's the radical perception of social constructivism. It, it, it can be much more nuanced and blended with other theories. But um, one of the particular categories that stands out is, is the deaf community, because it really is a community. There really is deaf culture. There are deaf languages that are used. And many deaf people will tell you that no, they are not disabled. They are a linguistic minority and not uh, and they are not disabled. So, uh, I mean, that is one particular distinction. I, we see that emerging from what you would call the non-neurotypical community, particularly people who have been diagnosed on, or people who are on the autistic spectrum. Um, many of them would be uncomfortable with whether there's a medical diagnosis or not for what they are, who see themselves as different rather than less. So, yeah, that, that does exist. Absolutely. Uh, one last question. Can you say, uh, uh, either of you wish to say a bit about uh, the prospects for this wonderful collaboration you've been working on? What's next? What are you, doing, what, what are you folks going to do together? Wow. <laughs> well, we're going to finish this article while she's here. Yeah. Um, we've been, actually the embassy that has been supporting her work um, would like to bring me back. I'd like to do some long-term teaching in Korea. And um, is it all universities, or just many of them, that require that a certain percentage of their classes mm -hmm. be taught in English? And you know, I can do that. I'm pretty good at it. Mm -hmm. And I, I would love to. That was, I was so well received at Korea University, which doesn't even have a music department, but she set me up to speak in sociology and in law, and they, my work intersects with both of those fields. Mm -hmm. And was even just a day in that environment was fantastic. So. How much better it would be to spend more time there, and the food also is great. Mm -hmm. Well, my my best wishes. For well, thank you, you so much for your for for your future collaborations and for your individual work. Thank you.